Hey, hey, welcome back to the Bass Podcast. Hello. What's going on, everybody? It's good to see you. Carson, how are you doing, buddy? You know, I'm doing good. How are you? Solid. <laughs> good. <laughs> right on. Well, uh, we have our friend Alana Rocklin here, who Ooh. we were introduced uh, via Dwayne Lundy, uh, our, our friend and also pod alumni. That's right. Um, she has worked with or is a member of STS9, Sub ID has also worked with people like Rick Ross, Jim James, Jeff Coffin, Nancy Griffith. Coming up, there's a gig with Corey Wong. Uh, a lot. That's awesome. How are you? I'm great. What's up, guys? <laughs> Yo. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for jumping on. Um, what are you doing these days? Is it kind of dead season for you? We just got done with New Year's. Our New Year's run. Uh, we do do a new year's run every year it's always a big big thing and so we went back to atlanta for that which is a kind of a hometown for for the band um and that was super fun played three nights there came home and um just kind of working on all kinds of things around the band just music we're working on you know next year all the little details for shows and things like that. Um, and then gearing up for, uh, a Costa Rica, um, show in early March. So. Sick. That's super fun. <laughs> Good place to be in March. Yeah. Yeah. Be fun. Yeah. Um, and then you also, you have a project sub ID as well. And that's like some of your own compositions as well. You and another yes. member. That is my husband and I, uh, awesome. Brad Bowden and I, uh, we've done this, it's actually the reason and how we ended, how I ended up in STS nine was because of sub ID and our band. And nice. um, we opened up for those guys, I think the first time in 2000, I mean, a long time ago. And so we've had a band together for, for quite a while. We released an album um, on, on 1320 records, which is STS nine's label. And we do a lot of shows in and around Denver and we're actually gearing up super excited we're um we're gonna play at um our festival resonate which is in florida at swanee and we're gonna do a set there and so we've been yeah we're definitely in the sub id mode right now trying to get ready for that so do you guys focus more on festival type sets it seems like when i was when i was looking at instagram pages and stuff it's a lot of festivals is it kind of curated towards that experience or do, is it a little bit of both I think it's it's both. Um, I think in post COVID, our touring has really changed a lot for SDS Nine, um, and we we tend to do um, specific like two or three night runs in a city instead of oh, like nice. going out for six weeks at a time. So we do like we'll show up in Austin and do two or three nights there, and then have a break, and then go. Um, and festivals have been a really big part of the band forever. Um, it's it's definitely a big part of how they grew and how we grew and continue to grow. So we do do a lot of festivals. And I think it just looks that way right now because of how we're doing our, you know, touring. It's, it's just a little bit different. I think it's uh, for years uh, we did two six-week tours and then a full festival summer. I mean, you know, and I think after COVID, we kind of all just kind of said, well, let's try to do something different. So that's cool. Fun. That's yeah. kind of how my current or my, my band is, is trying to do it where it's like a front loaded tour, a back tour festivals in the summer, which is cool. It's, I mean, no matter what you do with a little bit of structure is nice or something, something to plan on. How are you balancing that and a lot of your freelance type gigs where you're filling in or you're doing other acts or how does that work? Yeah. Well, it's, you know, right now for years I lived in Nashville, you know, and, and when I lived there, I was freelance a hundred percent. So that's where a lot of those, you know, Jim James, Nancy Griffith, all that kind of stuff was that period. I, I'm really just focused on STS nine and sub ID and every now and again, I'll have a little, somebody will ask me to do something and I'll have to prepare for it, um, which is, which is always fun. You know, it's fun to just kind of have to do things you're not used to or, or learn songs you didn't know or play with new people. So um, I, I do that every now and again, but my main focus is just those two uh, STS9 and sub ID. Nice. I was able to find the, uh, the Austin city limits, Jim James yeah. set, 
which was really cool. It was really cool. And it's all sometimes not super easy to find a lot of those Austin City Limit sets. So it's, it's like somebody like bootleg uploaded it and I was like, oh, cool. Well, there she is. Cool. Great. Yeah. <laughs> and I th- okay. maybe there's another couple YouTube performances, but what was it like? Um, the aesthetics are so different. Or, yeah. I mean, they're, they're similar in a lot of ways, but it's like you were Rickenbacker, P-Bass in that era. Um, was that for everything you did or was that for that specific act? That was for that. Um, I kind of, you know, I made a sort of a, a name for myself being someone in Nashville that could do a lot of different things and play. I play upright bass, so a lot of different uh, and a lot of people would call me for that, you know, like knowing that I could play an upright bass if they needed it or a fretless bass or whatever. Um, and Jim's thing was so specific because that particular tour and that music is really almost even different from what they do, what he normally does too. So we were, you know, there was a whole uh, electronic element going on and, 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 but I think the bass being that, um, he played the bass on the album so it was all his basses and so you know i tried to just kind of like stick to that because we were playing the album oh, in its entirety the whole tour we just played the album and we played if we do an encore we do some other things within it but we'd always play the album in in order and um the rickenbacker was his he he was like, what bass do you want to play? I mean, he has so many amazing instruments. And so he was like, you want to play this? You want to play that? <laughs> you know, the Rick was so cool. Um, and so um, the P bass was just obvious. It was just like, I, I'd have to have it, you know. Um, and I don't play it so much, you know. I've played it on some albums, you know. Um, SC's 9 did an album called Wave Spell. I played it the whole, way, the entire album um but i love p bass and i love you know playing it so it was it was really fun to do that he also was you know um it was cool because i did my my midi bass thing with him but he also you know was like we use this pedal for this because i used it on the album and here's the pedal so that was fun you know i you know i don't i'm not really a big big pedal person so that was super cool yeah yeah that's super cool Nice. Um, so we, we talk every once in a while about like the, the Rick stuff. And I, so I've got one too. And I find that like when that's in my hands, like I'm a different bass player. Like, yeah. do you run into that same thing where it's just like, you're just a new you when you, it's just so different from, especially yeah. a P bass or a J bass. Do you find that bring something out of you? Exactly. And that was like the whole inspiration for switching. I mean, I switched bases a lot on that tour and um, that was kind of the whole inspiration was like just, what it would enable me to play or how I would play something. Um, the simplicity of the bass lines, I mean, the be- most beautiful simplicity on the album. So I really wanted to like the nuance of it was like super important. So when I would pick up the Rick, all of a sudden I could feel like I was playing that, you know, line, how it was intended. Um, and I love that. I love that about playing four strings and five strings. Um, I primarily play five strings. That's my, if I, that's my go-to with what I'm comfortable with, what I like to play, but certain things, you know, it's just like, if I, if I use the P or if I use a four string, I'm going to immediately change how I play it. Yeah. It's cool. Interesting. So did you, were you with upright first? Cause it's interesting to hear an upright player say they prefer a five string. I isn't okay. I started I playing it. electric bass. Yeah. I started playing electric bass at eight and I, you know, I still have my, um, my my bass from that from eight years old and and then when i was 10 uh, i started playing in the youth orchestra at my school and basically they were like do you want to take home ec or do you want to or does anyone play an instrument and i was like uh i play the electric bass and they're like well here's a here's a upright bass like you can play it's the same notes you know i read music at that point so it was like you know just figure it out and i kind of just like got really into it and then for you know middle school um, pretty much up until I got into high school, I was actually really not playing much electric bass and, um, I was playing in orchestra, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and really obsessed with that. And then I kind of went back to electric bass for a while. And I think like, 
that's common. Like when I talk to people that double a lot, they say that like I've asked I've asked this question to Stanley Clark, to Christian McBride, to uh, to Victor Wooten. Um, like, how do you maintain both chops? Like, because it's really like different, you know. Um, and I think it's a common thing where you just kind of like have periods of time where you're sort of focused on one. Um, and I got into playing five string, just like, you know, I went to school for upright to, to be, I thought I was going to be, you know, like an orchestral player and, you know, got my degree in jazz and I had a band at, in college and it just, I started to five strings started to become popular and I started to kind of really gravitate towards like wanting to have lower notes. Um, I think if I could have an upright with an extension, I probably would, <laughs> but I, I don't have one. Um, but I, I just, I just kept hearing that, you know, like certain keys, like I'd be in C and I'd be like, ah, oh, I want to go, boom, you know, <laughs> so that was the inspiration. Now I'm just hooked on it, you know? That's awesome. Yeah. But I feel like yeah. people that play a lot of electric solely, like don't really understand that not only is it like a different place in the music that upright takes, but it's like like physically like the physical muscles and like when you're doing like jazz stuff like the whole side of your pointer finger like it it's just such a beast to wrangle that it, it it is just it's night and day and you're totally right when you kind of flip between the two like i i did just a little bit of jazz through college and it, it was seriously just so different to like keep those chops up and still play like you know the country or rock or whatever outside of that jazz group that i was playing with so I don't really know. I tried to learn for just a second upright in college because they had an orchestra program, but the ones they offered me, the action was insane because it was all just like ready for a bow, that kind of thing. So I gave up yeah. on it. But isn't isn't a lot of that, like your mindset when you're an upright player, isn't it position-based or some of it position-based, like hand spot? Yeah. So, you know, there's there's a couple schools of thought, um, two main schools of thought on upright bass technique. And it's something that, like, if you're going to play the upright bass, you you have to have technique. You have to have somebody show you. Otherwise, you will get frustrated and you'll be like, ah. um, so there's two schools of thought. One being that you, like you said, you have like this. So the, the second and third finger being together. And then one through four, and that gives you your whole step, right? So if you think of this as A and this is B natural, this is B flat, right? And so as you continue to go up the neck, you, you keep the position, but it gets smaller, right? And keeping that position and knowing those positions helps you stay in tune. The other school of thought is that you, that you use your thumb to pivot this way and that way. Um, I come from the first school of thought. And I, um, in college, I studied with Stuart Sankey, who is the Samandal. The Samandal is what I'm referring to in this technique, Samandal technique. And he actually was the person that edited the method book on it. So he was like the Samandal guru, synonymous nice. with Samandal. So that's kind of where I come from. And I think that this, you know, studying that, it does help you go back and forth easily because it's it's really about that positioning that will ensure that you're playing in tune and then you know keeping your thumb back here you know whereas like an electric bass you might want to especially on a four string right you might want to play like this mm -hmm. so let me connect that to say that i think part of the reason why i like to play a five string is because it forces me to put my thumb behind because the width of the neck nice, yeah so that makes it feel more like an upright bass to me, I think, sometimes. And I, I think that's probably part of the reason why I like to do it. But then when I, like you said, when I get on that four string and also my thumb kind of goes a little far back, then it makes me like play <laughs> different. You know? so, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm primarily a five string player as well. And when yeah. I go to fours, I do think I play, I, I don't always want to say better, but I think I play more lyrical because I'm like only in a certain box, but that yes. it also forces me farther up the neck than I expected to be because I can kind of play lyrical a little farther down the neck and have room on a five, not so much on a four. And I end up more like in the McCartney range in a cool yeah. way, but I also have to like mentally adjust to that. Is, is it a little bit of like a faux pas too to use your third finger 
with upright players. Right. So you don't use your third finger until you get all the way to like really like G on the G string, like all the way up there. Um, and then you're in thumb position. They call it thumb position. And your thumb is resting on that G harmonic. And then you use your third finger because the spacing gets smaller, right? Um, in, in order to stay in tune. But back here, all the way around, I never use my third finger. So that is a thing. Do you use it on electric bass? Have you found I yourself not using bass. your third? Always on electric bass, but I had to oh, okay. work on it a lot. Yeah. Because my third finger was always, is, is still always the weak one because just of that. So it's like, I, I'm always, but I love the whole Jocko one finger, one fret notion of just, you know, each one. Uh, because the spacing is quite smaller. Like I think maybe some people that don't play upright, they don't realize, but like when you're back in first, like half position is what they call it. Like F on the E string, like all the way back there. I mean the between F and G or B flat and C, that is a huge. It's monstrous. It's yeah, it is. <laughs> it's not, you know, so it's totally different. Yeah. Is, isn't there a sizing thing with upright? Do you play like a three fourth or a full? Yes. So a three fourth three is like quarter. standard. Almost everybody plays a three quarter. Yeah. Um, only huge, giant people will play full size, and even like like my teacher um, Rodney Whitaker, he's a a mate. If you don't anybody listening to this, look up Stuart Sankey. Look up Rodney Whitaker. These are amazing people. Um, he actually had a full size for a minute, and he was like, I couldn't do it. He he loved it because he's primarily you know a, um, a traditional jazz bass player, so he's really trying to project the sound and not be so amplified. You know, a lot of those guys really they don't like that sound. They want it to be sounding more just like the bass sounds. So the full size gives you more sound for sure, but it just it kills your hand. I mean, if you have to play in like jazz, a lot of the stuff we're playing is in horn keys so we're playing b flat f and we're dying back there. e flat <laughs> yeah e flat a flat e flat yeah or a flat yeah. oh yeah every so time it's, um, yeah it, it he was like he he tried so after that i was like yeah i mean i'd never even considered going to a full size um victor wooten has a bass that's a half size it's so fun to play it's like it's like playing a um like a small scale electric bass and you like you're like you know like yeah. flying nice. yeah so. Cool. I did the old jazz guys like Ray Brown kind of thing. Were, were they on a three quarter? Okay, so it, it's yeah. been the standard since American music has been going. You know, interesting. Yep. Wow. Yep. The more you know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Want another tip about upright bass uh, for anyone that doesn't know? Yeah. There's two types of necks. There is an E flat neck and a D neck. So if you're going to like say somebody's going to backline me a upright bass, God forbid, I never try to do that because that's always frightening. But if you have to, the most important thing to ask for is like, are you a D neck or are you an E flat neck? So what that means is if you put your thumb all the way um, down on the neck where the body and the neck meet, um, and you put your first finger down on the G string, is that a D or is that an E flat? Now, for me, I play a D neck. Almost everybody, most people do play D necks, but the E flats are they're common. And if you if you don't get the, if you're a D player and you get an E flat, you're like it's you're swimming. Oh no, you know? yeah. <laughs> so that, that doesn't sound very fun. That's a good that. that's a good pivot too because it's such a a beast to travel with. But like in general, let let's talk about traveling with a base. Uh, yeah. Are you, to, what's your process like when you're flying? We could maybe yeah. do electric and upright. Maybe, I don't know if you'd ever flown with an upright, but. I have. Um, okay. <laughs> I know. Okay. So. We need the secrets. We get different stuff. Every listen, person we ask. Listen, man, this is a big topic. Any musician out there, any bass player, y'all know. This is like, in fact, just the other day on Facebook, this came up. Is it another air, uh, uh, United breaks guitars. It, well, no, it was more like it was more about because post COVID, it's harder and harder to get your bass, especially bass, on the plane in the overhead. Right? It's it's become more of a challenge, I think personally, and um, you know, just talking about what the rules are. 
like what what are the actual real rules and um you know a lot of us who try to i generally for years would always take my base in a gig bag on the plane put it in the overhead that was like what i would do i love i use mono cases i absolutely love them i i trust them when i have to put it in the overhead if somebody you know somebody doesn't see it and they're or they're just rude and they start to push their bag in like why can't i get my bag in i'm not stressed honestly because i know that case is just so solid um there's rules right there's the faa rules there's um most musicians unions have these rules and they're in association with the faa so you have the right to take your instrument on if you are first in line or if you're if if there is room in the overhead and you can fit your instrument you have a right to put it in there full stop like they can't remove it they shouldn't it's against the rules a lot of us carry these the faa rules in our gig bags i do a couple of weeks ago in fact i was had my base and um the woman and you know i've fl- flown i've flown united for over a decade exclusively our whole band does wow wouldn't let me on the flight was like you have to buy a seat for that you, i was first in line i have status you know she's like you can't buy a seat for that you have to buy a seat for that i'm not gonna let you on the plane um she's like i'm calling my supervisor i i'm like no here's the fa rules i'm allowed i'm you know you have to let me try but if it doesn't fit i'll gate check it like i'm always very nice so another tip if they try to be weird just be nice you know just try to be calm and nice you're very accommodating to what they want right so i'm like you know no problem give me the tag if it doesn't fit i'm happy to get checked but I'm, I'm i have the right to try no you're wrong i mean she's calling the supervisor and i was with my son so i was just like i just started walking on the plane right and she's like because <laughs> i'd already done my boarding pass and so she's like you know radioing somebody and i'm thinking they're gonna kick me off this flight like, right and uh, get on the plane, put my base overhead, no problem, like it always does, right? Sit down, and I'm waiting, waiting, and nothing happens. I take off, great, no problem. But when I got back, I call United, and I was like, look, I, I've i spent, we, this is like, I fly United exclusively. Like, you, you know, this is the rule. This woman was really rude. She was embarrassing me. She was trying to, like, stop the whole process for me to get a supervisor, all this stuff. They ended up giving me a voucher. Wow. For, uh, nice. So if if you anybody trying to f- travel with the uh, with the electric base on the plane, try to be first. Try to get on as soon as possible. Look up the FAA rules. Highlight the part that says that you have the right to da 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 da. And <clears throat> if they try, if they you know if they're not cool about it or whatever, call the airline. Be like you know it's worth it. Two hundred dollar voucher is not hundred percent. Yeah, man. Uh, the upright. I've never successfully gotten my base on a plane uh overhead i know he's afraid of it i think because i i'll put it up there but i've tried to take it before uh well okay here's 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 the caveat uh we were flying frontier so we then bought a seat for it which was cheaper than a bag right that (laughs) instance (laughs) kind of Uh, is this amazing honestly uh I've actually had better luck with Frontier because it's just like, hey, I have a ticket for it. Cool. Keep going kind of thing. Hey, so that's, a, that's a strategy. That's actually really good. Um, all the other times, United would United has never let me gate check an instrument. They have taken it from the gate, but they yeah. will not return it to me at the end of the flight. They say it has to go to baggage claim. So... In my experience, now again, I like I have, I'm the dead opposite. <laughs> I haven't printed out the rules. I haven't all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I've started attempting to do the. Um, uh, I have an SKB flight case with wheels, like a big molded, yep. like yep. really nice case. Yep. T- too heavy to really drag around an airport, like if you've got a connection or that kind of thing. However, it seems like every time my only strategy that's worked has been. I have it with me. I kind of try to keep it out of their sight and they always have oversold 
And they're like, if anybody's willing to put their bag on, and then I take my base up and I give it to them, and at least they don't charge me for oversize at that point. But I've never, I've never, I'm too scared to take a mono bag. I have a mono bag. I'm too nervous. See, I've lost so many times on Delta has been the best for me. American, I've lost every time, but I've been able to gate check. United, I've always been forced to do baggage claim. See, I think you nailed you're it. You're different. Yeah, I, I am totally different. I'm I'm always successful. So a good buddy of mine taught me a long time ago, and you said this: the best thing you can do is go up to the gate agent and say, "Hey, do you mind if I just try it first? Like, can I right. just can I try it? I promise, like it's not a big deal, but I want to try it because it's. I always pull the it's my livelihood card. Right. Um, Cause it is, Cause and, it is, and it matters, and I need it to be there. Like you can't send this to Miami when I'm trying to be in San Diego. Like we we have no room for these mistakes. So I'm like, it needs to be on this plane. What can we do? And they always are like, let me help you out. And I mean, half the time they'll just open the coat closet for me, and I'm down. I do. Yes, I, I love it. But yeah, no, he always got the bad luck. Uh, it, 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 it scares me. Problem, man. It, you know, it's harder though. I'll say, like post COVID, is harder. I try to avoid it now. Like I'm, I'm always kind of like, oh, if I can leave my base on the road, I'll try. But I like to have my main instrument with me, especially if, how we're touring now. We have time in between, and so I want it at home because I want to record with it or I want to work on stuff. Um, and it is hard, and it, I think it is there. There's it, there is a part of it that is like will, sheer will to to get it on. Like you, it, like like believing that you will because if you are, um, they it. And it's airline to airline. You do have to have status. I think that helps. What you're talking about with Frontier is actually a really brilliant strategy. Um, and the thing they were talking about online the other day that kind of prompted this whole conversation was that ultimately the captain has the final say in whether you can take your instrument on or off. Huh. I was like, wow, I didn't know that. But apparently that is true. Can you ask and to I, speak to the captain? <laughs> Seriously. I mean, can't like... You Is that can, what you, you do? I guess you can. I, I've never done it. I guess you can. I know I know that, you know, there's been times like, I know one time Victor was telling me that, I don't know if he ran into the captain, the captain knew who he was, and was like, let me put your base in the cockpit with me. Okay. <laughs> he wants Whoa. to play it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, I'd say know. that too. <laughs> That's crazy. But um, yeah, a lot of times I'll ask like, and do you have any closet space? And they will. It's getting harder. I, it's really a shame because, like, it is like there should be some there should be some like consistency with how we can travel with our instruments because it is like you just can't, you just never know. It's like a crapshoot, and I think the crapshoot part of it is what steers me away from dealing with it now. So I'm just like, I just don't even want to like deal with it, you know? Because just people are just a lot more rude about it too. Like when they see your instrument up there. When we're traveling as a whole band, it kind of helps because it'll be like two of us have guitars and we can kind of just like stack them on top of each other and put other, you know, and it's like, okay, we just got all of our stuff in one little thing, you know, and whatever. Cause they're odd size, you know, things, you know, all this stuff, you know, our keyboard player will have a modular synth with him that he has to get that. It's just, man, it's just getting harder and harder. I agree. And they keep, it seems like they keep changing rules, even for like what they cracked down recently on, maybe within the last couple of years, post COVID, like you're saying, is, is just like shoulder bags. And I'm like, like, you know, like where you're holding like a passport right here. And they're like, no, no, that has to be in your bag. Yeah. You and, have to put that inside your bag. Like Cause bag. if not, it's another bag. And I understand it, but they're cracking more down on it. And I'm like, that's, I'm just holding my passport right here. Yeah. So I don't have to get it out of my bag. Like, it, I don't know. It it's just funny. I see the times changing is what I'm saying. I've heard some of the aircrafts too as they're shrinking overhead space, a base is really close or not going to fit in some of them. So apparently there's a new design. Uh, this is this is like for anyone that thinks that musicians talk about like exciting things, what we actually talk about is like there's a new design for the overhead and I think it's yeah. going to be shorter um but on united apparently there is and in fact i will go when i'm taking a flight if i know i'm taking my base i'll look up what the plane is i'll look up what the overhead dimensions are i mean it's way too much work to have to like (laughs) i do the same thing (laughs) yeah that's awesome but they are changing i'm hearing that okay so let's uh just this 
t- subject gives me a lot of anxiety. Uh, <laughs> but let's run it back. Okay, say she physically has stopped you from getting on the aircraft. What what is your next like hail mary before just like giving up? Like, and if you do give up and your base gets broken, I guess that's you have status, well, so that I, I, helps I, your your phone call well, get through. I mean, maybe this is just silly, but the gate agent she's staying there, right? She's not moving. The other person on the other end, they have no idea what the gate agent just said. Give me the ticket. I'm going to I'm gonna have them check it. No problem. And I literally throw the ticket in my pocket, and then I walk on with the base. But, I mean, that is the, the best thing to do. Yes. This particular woman, she was like, she was like, I've never been stopped like that. Like, usually it'll be like, I'll say to them, hey, no problem. Like, I'm going to just try, and I'm happy to gate check it. So give me the ticket. You know, and if they have to put it on your instrument, fine. Let them put it on. I tear it off. I, I literally walk away and just tear it off and walk on. And if for some reason I couldn't get it on, then I would say, like, hey, could you gate check it? And I've never had a problem with that. And I always, the other thing I'll say is if you can hand it to somebody that's going to put it underneath, you know, um, on the, the, the way there, t- try to tip them. That's, I was about to ask about that. <laughs> Was it like, Adam ne- Neely? Is that his name? Some, somebody did a did a uh, a video where they were showing they would tip people. Oh yeah, to, to I'll gate tip check. people, and they'll be like, "Okay, I'm gonna put it in last. I'm gonna put it in a good spot." And then, like, a lot of times, I'll just go like on the way out. Like, it sucks because you have to wait, but like, wait for the person and be like, "Hey, you know, here's like, offer them some money. Hey, I have my instrument in there. I know you need to." put it on the thing. Can you hand it to me? You know, um, so to that's avoid two, like, two separate people you're tipping. Those two separate. People. Are you handing them fives or are you handing them twenties? I mean, it depends <laughs> on how I'm trying to hand them tens, but it depends that's on. Okay, how, cool. Yeah. It depends on how like serious the situation is and the vibe of the person. If I feel like the person is like, Oh, you're, you play the bass. Cool. Like, let me help you. <laughs> you know, like, you know, I'll be like, okay, cool, ten dollars. But if I'll start there, and if and if they're like kind of being a dick, I'll be like, well, I mean, what about twenty? Is that <laughs> you know, like, yeah? We nice. Talking? Here we are. Five yeah. is too little. I think five is too little. I think you got to sure. go ten. Okay. All right. You heard it. Heard it here first. This is so funny because <laughs> a this is it's like we were saying before the pod. It's like there comes a moment where we're just like in the weeds of like base yep. nerddom. And that's what we're I mean, here where for. Where are you going to find this information? But I will say. It's going to be talk based and 20 people are going to disagree like back and forth the whole way through the thread. <laughs> and I will say this is super applicable mm-hmm. to like, yeah. I mean, the amount of times that I've, I mean, countless times I've just been needing someone to tell me like, what's going on? What's the best way to do it? Like, I mean, these little tips. So I love it. Well, you'll take a burner base. Sometimes I take bass that it, I always say if somebody snapped it in half, I wouldn't cry. Um, that's what I'm doing for Costa Rica. Yep. And Rican. I, yep. And I always say like, so we'll go play someplace like Vegas and I'm like, I mean, guitar center's got a good return policy. Like I could just get out there, be like, Ooh, look at this fun stuff on the wall. Like, you know, and then grab, I'm like, I've got a backup plan, but if I can get that bass on there, I'm going to get it on there. But I'm with you. I got the double mono bag, like the double one. So I'm always traveling with two. Wow. And, oh, and if, I oh, I, I love the double. But uh, if I'm flying with it, I'll have one and close. So I'm like, it's padded as can be. We're I'm okay. If somebody's, like you said, if somebody's shoving, it's all good. It's all good. But yep. scares the crap out of me. Yeah, <laughs> no. I, I, I gush about it every time. I have a Yamaha BB5000, and it's like a... They were practically a prototype five-string in the 80s. It was the first yeah. mass-produced five-string. Uh, and their neck through, and, like, it is very hard to find them right now at an even almost reasonable price because it's just, like, they're vintage-ish. So it's just soaring the price. And it, in particular, I would be so heartbroken but it's my oh, instrument. I mean, it's my voice. So yeah, but in your case, I've got, a, um, I've got a Lakeland from it's. They made two of them in 1999. This is n- number 9902. They took all the wood, the best wood from that year that they found, and they're like, "We're going to make two insane instruments." Oh my gosh! And I have one of those. And when um, 
Dan Lakin, you know, in late at Lakeland in Chicago, especially back in the day, there was just like you you could go up there and jam. And um he he, he was like, Okay, you know, I wanna I wanna endorse you. Here, pick any one of these. Pick pick any one of these bases and we'll he didn't know that bass was in there. So I played them all and I played and this one was like, why does it yeah. sound weird? right? It sounds like it has the Bartolini's, the old school Lakeland. And uh he was like, Was that in there? I'm like, yeah, just it was in there. He's like, Oh no, now I guess I guess I have to give it to you. So I have this really rare Lakeland bass. Then on top of that, is that the blue one? It's it's like purple. It's like dark. It looks oh, okay. Blue. Yeah, my son he always says it's blue. It's actually it's like dark dark purple. Nice. Um, but he uh, but uh, I have a a MIDI system in the in it where I have like um, MIDI triggers in all the frets in each fret. You can't even take the neck off of it. It's it's very you know I mean custom as custom can be. So I get you. I, I'm like, you know, but like at the same time, I'm like, man, this is, this is, this is my sound. Right. Like I have this to have this. Like I can't. Yeah. Like I, I don't want to like taking a, like, I'm going to take this, you know, just Lakeland that I have that to Costa Rica that I'm not so stressed about. Like I wouldn't take that one. I have a P base. My P base is, was given to me by Willie Weeks. It's one of his bases. Insane. I do not want to take that. I actually, I would, I won't take that on the plane because that's just too, it's just too special. But like, um, I hear you. It's, and those Yamahas are dope. Crazy. I know which one. Oh, they're, they're very fun. (laughs) I, and honestly, it's kind of ruined everything because I talk about it so much that it is (laughs) even harder to find them now. Uh, well, okay. Let's talk about the MIDI bass since we've made it all the way there. Perfect transition. Um, what so you had that system installed later yeah so um i've been into midi bass for a long time it's kind of like the be- like one of the things we've always done in sub id mm-hmm. and my husband and i made a midi bass out of a dj5 um in i want to say it's like 2003 or something a while ago and i've always been into that i played in a band in college where the instrumentation was bass drums vocals and midi trumpet and my friend mark kershenman kind of inspired me to like think about you can you can make any instrument into a midi controller right and so i've been messing with it for years and years it's always kind of been something that i really put a lot of time into versus like pedals like that's why i'm not so into pedals i kind of went all right in on the midi and um so some years ago when I joined STS nine, um, a decade ago, crazy. Um, I actually have written down here almost 10 almost or I guess 10. right um, at 10. Crazy. Um, the, uh, the other bass, the original bass player, he would play keyboard on some things. And I, this is not my thing. Um, I don't really never wanted to do that. I always feel like I'm, I'm such a like basic keyboard player that I'm embarrassed to stand up there and with my amazing keyboard player in the me band. Too. And I still do like, it, but me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I put a lot of time into this mini thing and, uh, actually it was, I think it was like 2015 or so, um, Victor Wooten called and was like, you've got to check this out. There's this guy doing this system called fret tracks in Nashville. I just got one. A couple people have them. They are, they're finally, they finally did it. They finally figured out how to do this mini thing to where we can actually play with it. It's, 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 um, it triggers, there's no latency. Um, it's a regular that was about MIDI to be my cable. question. Yeah. Yeah. Reg- regular MIDI cable out of your base. Um, there's no, like, you know how you have to buy these like crazy guitar MIDI cables that no one has and they break. And so he was the one that hit me to it. And I immediately was like, I, I need this because in STS nine, I mean, I was doing, cr- you-, you know how the latency is where I would have to displace all my octaves to play up here so that it would be quicker. So I'd be playing like the lowest lows, like sub bass, but I'd be like all the way up here, you know? Um, and it, it, it definitely got to a point where it was like, man, I'm going to hit a wall with this band trying to do this and I've got to figure out something else. So it was like, timing was perfect. It was like, you know, I went and checked it out and it was scary because they have to route your neck out mm-hmm. and literally each fret 
they have to read. I mean, it's like, uh, and so the advice Vic gave me was, he was like, the first time I did it, I used a base that I didn't really care about so much. And it was a mistake because now I don't want to play it because the actual base isn't one that I like to play. And I have this, and I want to play the MIDI stuff, but now I have this, he's like, so go for it. Like do it with the one, the base you want. So I took that 9902 Lakeland base, which was very scary and hit and um, Lee Young, who, who runs fret tracks and his partner, um, Ribsky, who's also a luthier, they do it together and they do the mod together. So he does, Lee does all the, you know, more, um, all the soldering and all the, the fret work. And then, um, Ribsky does all the paint and all the woodwork because they have to like, you have a whole other cavity in the, I don't have it with me or I'd show you, but they, they don't let the whole other cavity in there. They got to match the paint. So it looks right. They've got to put like a whole, I mean, it's, it's a lot to do. So regardless it came out beautiful loved it was like this is the best thing's ever happened to me because when you hit the string triggers the note in the left hand so when this the string hits the fret that triggers the note so it, sustain no longer becomes a factor in that well there's all kinds so you can send each fret is just a midi trigger so it can be note on or off information it can be cc information so each fret, like frets, um, I'm into this. this Sorry, I'm like, <laughs> okay, this is the most nerdy stuff. Like, we're no, so this here is for good. It. Okay, so people ask me about this. I'm like, do you really want to know? Because we want to know. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> the people need okay. it. Okay, so frets one through seven on strings G and D um, are also patch changes. So I can program my synth. I use a virus TI synth. Thank you, virus. Um, um, I could program those to whatever patches so I could change. So like fret, fret one is scene, whatever fret two or right. Fret I, one is big bass. Fret okay. Two yeah. Is sounds bass, you know, not necessarily yeah, different uh, sounds. Right. Songs. So not only can I play note on information and note off information, but I can also use it to send CC messages. So those particular ones are this all, is the coolest thing ever. It, it's crazy. So the, what this guy came up with, this is going to blow your mind. So all, so those are the past changes on, on the a string frets one through four, one through five, maybe are millisecond delays. So because you're, you're triggering the note with your left hand, your right hand means nothing, but you have the bass sound going. If you want, you, you don't have to, so to line those two up, so they're both going together and you don't have like a little bit of a note, then note situation, you can delay it based on your technique and how you play. So, wow. so it's crazy, right? So that's the delays. Then you've got, so on the bass, there's, if you looked at it, there's, um, there's a button and there's also a knob. Again, that knob, you can pro, you can send whatever you want it to be. So like, if I change fret four on the E string, if I press that CC, the button CC, I have it so that then that knob is no longer volume. It becomes a filter cutoff, uh -huh. right? So I can change it to whatever I want. I can make it, you know, anything, anything I want. I can have it change. Yeah. For some reason I had in my head like, okay, you're still going to have to, use both hands. You're going to have to strike the instrument and right. that, and the sustain is going to send the MIDI note, but that opens up a crazy amount of doors where you're just using your left hand and with your right hand, hand, are you manipulating a, controls on the synth or on the bass? Or? Yeah, I do. A lot of times I do that because it's easier for me. Sometimes like if I'm doing like some kind of like, you know, just like straight, like sub bass part, you know, it's not like I'm playing like all these notes. I'm maybe just playing, you know, root fifth, whatever but i want to have an effect on it that i want to sometimes it's easier for me to do it on the synth and not on the bass right other times it's different that would um, be my thought too and so every fret so like um fret 12 on the g string that's octave up i can change octave i mean literally think of it think of what you want to do like we can do it you know we can figure out and so it but I did so now I have two of these 
bases. I have my red base, which is the 9902. Then I have this other purple base that I made that what the Lakeland made for me that was like um, intended to be exactly like 9902, but a little smaller, a little lighter. Um, and always from the get go, knowing we were going to put fret tracks in it. So it wasn't, it was built with that in mind. Uh, we found the exact Bartolini's from 1999. We put that, those in them. I mean, we, I, I tried to get it as close as possible. It's not because the wood's different. And so the red base is still a little brighter. It's still a little punchier, but I love the, the way actually it's a little, the purple base is darker, bless you. And I like that about it. But the mini base thing is, it's, crazy man i mean you can do it you should definitely look it up i mean the, what victor does on it is really crazy because of his whole left tapping stuff right and like i said it's only this doesn't really matter right so open strings nothing right you don't have uh you're not triggering anything on open strings so everything has to be closed so that is one thing about it um are you hitting a button or a mute to like switch over to a midi note or or a midi mode or does your front of house guy know this part's I have coming it up. on a volume. Okay. Um, actually, and actually what, you know, my, my husband, who's like an amazing engineer and um, sound designer and just all around amazing uh, musical mind. I used to use a volume pedal, right? In order to do that, I had, you know, and I wanted stereo because I, my synth is in stereo and I have some things that are stereo. So in order to do that, I mean, the amount of cabling and the amount of shit um, was just ridiculous and he he was like we were redoing my my rig my road rig and he was like why don't we try to just put this like on a midi control like control volume like instead of so now we're not changing we're not going to audio we're just it's staying midi so now i have my volume it's just you know um just a midi controller that i've programmed to just do volume so when i want to have the midi in it goes all the way down if I want to just have it half, like if I'm playing, like I can have a pad going underneath something I'm playing. People aren't, they don't really realize that it's me sending that pad and it doesn't really affect necessarily what I'm the baseline or the base part. It's just kind of like underneath it and I can have that at half. So it's a little bit just underneath what I'm doing. Um, and then of course muted all the way off. So it, it really, it's pretty easy. So technically um, right now in, in STS-9, we actually have, we're sending, because all of us have MIDI, we're sending MIDI information to our lighting person. Yep. It's got yep. a little bit crazy. This is wild. <laughs> it's wild. What well, Cetra and I is wild. Okay, so, and now one of the things we're dealing with um, that our lighting guy wasn't really, didn't really understand about what I have going on. I'm like, dude, the problem with my thing is that MIDI is going all the time. So even if I'm just playing, and you're not hearing it, it's still happening. Right. Right. So, so it's like, sometimes it'll just totally tweak his <laughs> thing out. Right. Cause it's just so much MIDI information, like, you know, um, but yeah, so that's the, that's fret tracks and it's, uh, it's absolutely incredible. Um, highly recommend that's checking fascinating. it out. Are you, yeah. uh, reliability with synths? Are you mostly doing, uh, an, uh, digital synth? and it's stereo or have you done um, analog like Moogs either? You know, the Moogs I tried, it's, it's really hard with all the oscillators mm -hmm. um, to get it, to get it consistent. I mean, I mean, you know, like it's MIDI is so fun when you start talking about it, but it really is a nightmare in a lot of ways. Like it can be. Yeah. Huge headache. Yeah. The fret tracks is very stable. It's very, very, um, because what he does is he programs your instrument to the synth. Now there's a general MIDI mode on it. So like I could potentially plug into any MIDI device, but where it works the best and has the less, um, the least amount of jargon, like MIDI bullshit that clogs the yeah, it's just sending sig signals all the time or ones and zeros. Exactly. And all so he time. has it optimized for each synth that you play so if you so for me for my virus wow. he actually has to take my synth and he has to to make it so it it's stable so it's as stable as it possibly can be so um to your answer is like i would love to trigger a move but it's just like there's too many variables that could right sure 
and tuning comes in. The tuning is the big part. You know, that's yeah. The, the newest, uh, the sub 37, I have the subsequent 37, which is yeah. almost the same thing. The tuning on that has been absolutely fantastic. Like really, really great. Stable. The I have at most tuned it like a cent with that's a tuner, awesome. which is huge because I had a little fatty stage two before this which were digitally controlled, but they were like infamously bad auto tune. Yes. Uh, and you'd have to sometimes send them back to the factory and just like start over kind of thing. Um, and that turned me off it for a while, but I just got this. I'm not a good synth player at all, but we just have like some atmospheric sure. stuff that we do. Um, but I honestly, it's so stable. I hate to say this, that I've stopped checking before I walk out. So that's awesome. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, real quick, real quick, uh, super nerd MIDI stuff. Who, where are you getting your, are you, were you running a global clock from? Are you pulling it from like a drum machine or Ableton or something? Or oh, that's a great question. I'm actually getting clock from our, our guitar player is also the person that handles our main computer super. and everybody in the band is getting clock from him. Including lighting. Including lighting. Nice. That is so wild and he's, so cool. He's running Ableton. So a lot of the lighting cues are within Ableton on that, but also, right. um, but also like he's get you know, um, so we're, yeah, we're all synced to, to, to that, to his computer. Nice. So that there's just like a web of MIDI cable across the stage. Dude, it is. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> our, we, God bless our tech, tech <laughs> but no, I mean, we do have it pretty, we've got it worked out you know it took a minute especially on some of the things like um modular things like um the modular a lot like there's all this delay compensation and they uh, we've had to work that out the the virus ti is very great it's great at clock that's one of the great things about it it's like i just go you know out of his little thing into my thing and it's just on i mean i can have any kind of um you know like say arpeggiated um you know bass you know like acid kind of right. sound or whatever, and i'm just one note and it is locked you know um that's so huge awesome. and that can be such a nightmare and kind of the genius with you know not to overlook that your third string is latency compensation like yeah. when you're getting to that level two a front of house guy it might even be checking your uh, your like a pre pedal board DI and a post pedal board DI and doing latency compensation, like even there of the two audio signals. So to be able to be in the digital realm and also accommodate for that. And even if, if it ever arose or something was going wrong, be able to line it up with your actual analog bass signal. That's fascinating or like delaying it on purpose. Yeah, and I don't have what's cool about the MIDI thing is like what I was saying about what, especially what what Brad instituted into it is now I have that is not, I mean I don't it, it, at least within my rig and my pedal board I'm not going into audio at all right which is great because right. now they're just coming straight out um, and I have I use all Neve DIs on my rig so I have four I have four four channels. New DI in my rig, two um, are dedicated to the virus, um, and then I have one that's just my base, and then I have one that is free. Usually, if I need to, sometimes we do upright stuff, and so I'll I'll use it for that. Um, but the Neve DI thing has been like a game changer for my whole sound for everything I do. I don't even. It's so good. It's that, just, and you're not the only person to say that on the show either. Thank you, Neve. Thank you for doing yeah, that. The for RNDI us. is so good. And then there's a stereo one. That's right. So, so. I have the stereo. I have, I have three channels at home. I mean, I'm in love with this sound to the point where it's changed my entire concept of what I'm doing on stage and how I'm running my stuff. I don't even, it's like I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to Costa Rica. I don't even care. I'm like, whatever. Give me a Neve DI, to yep. put in my bag. Ready to go. I know my tone is going to be on point. I know it's going to sound great. Um, it's really um, elevated the the virus a lot as well, just the synth bass tones. And so it's just like a pristine, I don't even know how to describe it. Weight is given yeah. to it, but yeah. clarity, 
Uh, I have like a tube DI. I didn't say the noble. I was waiting on. Sorry, we have a running thing about about the noble, the noble where I always mention it, and it's like people get too lusty after it. But I use a noble usually. Uh, but I have an R and DI as well, uh, and have experience with the ready. And it's like people don't get as excited or believe me when I'm when they're like, "What DI should I get?" It's like, well, if your budget's not a thousand dollars comfortably. The R and DI hangs or exceeds all of all of the top ones. It's right there with everything. It's just, it's do you tiny. want that sound? Right, exactly. If it's, it's durable, it, you know, when your fly durable. dates. Yeah. Now the only thing that sucks is you have to go to the sound guy and be like, "Hey, make sure you're giving me Phantom." But exactly. that, if you're in a real scenario, that shouldn't matter. It really shouldn't, and but uh, like me and my crazy ways, I've like. Like even for this Costa Rica trip, I think I've said to my our tour manager like at least five times, "You have to make sure they have Phantom Power." It's, I don't right. care. It's a legit, yeah. It's a legit thing because like if if that were to be the case, which I can't, it's like you think like how could that? How could they not have it? Um, it's happened. Well, it, it happened to me happened. once when I had it for it years. Happens. Yeah. Only so, once, but it has has happened. So yeah. yeah, if you're going down that route, you need to know. Well. <laughs> This has been amazing. Yes. I could talk about this literally all day. Uh, so honored to have you here and your time. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much for, for, for the ask and thanks to Dwayne. What up Dwayne? Thanks for yeah, that. Yeah. What up Dwayne? <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, man, let's, let's nerd out more on some base stuff. Love it. Would love I would to. love to. All right. Well, have an awesome day. We'll see y'all later. Bye.